The elephant in the room is based on a simple idea. What if? What if we could give it back? What if we could take an ivory carving, turn it back into a tusk, bring the tusk back to the dead elephant, and somehow bring the elephant back to life? That was the basic premise for the project. I went to school with a man named Bill Clark, and he is working with Interpol, and he's very well connected to the Kenyan Wildlife Service and uh, he made it possible for us to do almost everything including uh, know the vets that helped us dart the elephant and all the people that um, we worked with in Kenya and without him this would have been very very difficult if not impossible. We decided to proceed with the project and uh, we found many colleagues and friends who generously donated. Having worked in African wildlife conservation for close on 20 years when Travis approached me and my organization Wild Eyes Foundation with the concept for this film, The Elephant in the Room, I immediately recognized the powerful impact and potential that this film could have as a gentle reminder of where ivory comes from, that every time you see a carving or a trinket, that an elephant died for it. We also had to act quickly. We had a deadline. We needed to get this film to the CITES convention in Bangkok. What was interesting about Travis's script is that everyone really liked it. They liked the childlike concept of it and the fact that it actually offered a solution. Let's stop buying which will stop the killing. The script called for three locations, China, Burma and Kenya in Africa. Obviously for budgetary reasons we had to shoot the China and Burma locations in Chicago in our studio. Since the Chinese use the ivory for all sorts of things, including ancestor honoring, we're hoping if we can encourage the young people of China to honor the elephant in his life state with his tusks, that they won't have to remove the tusks in order to honor ancestors and use the ivory for other purposes. Once the filming in Chicago was done, we departed for Kenya. When we got to the customs in Kenya airport, we had, had to uh, open the crate and prove that these tusks were wooden and not ivory. And uh, all the policemen and all the customs officials came right over. We showed them pictures of them being carved and created. Once we showed them the storyboards and explained what we're doing, they started smiling and they became fans. And all supportive of our effort to help save the elephants. Filming wildlife in Kenya is quite a project. You just can't show up and start filming. You need to have many permits. Fees need to be paid to the right government officials. Park permits need to be issued. And we were able to do all that. You know, many people were on board helping us, including our associate in Nairobi, Kira Goodall, who's an American who lives in uh, Nairobi for the past 12 years, and she's a filmmaker. And she was on our team, and without her, it'd be almost impossible to have done this. As a wildlife filmmaker in Africa, I'm in the middle of this elephant crisis and I'm doing everything I can to help get the word out. When I got the script from Vladimir and Travis and read it, I smiled because it's so simple and such an elegant message. And I thought, wow, this might really reach a very wide audience. For the first sequence in Kenya, we needed an airport, but we couldn't use Wilson Airport because it's way too busy. So we found the Orly airstrip out on the Athi Plains. One of the scenes in the script required the crate with the tusks arriving in Kenya. We had to uh, secure an aircraft, Cessna caravan. We're gonna do uh, takeoff and landing uh, scene. And this is the scene where the crate comes to Kenya. So we're rigging up the camera on the inside to do a pilot's point of view for the approach. For the next series of shots, we had to move from Nairobi to Tsavo National Park. It's about a seven hour drive from Nairobi and once you get there, you realize the enormous size of this national park. It's the size almost of the state of Connecticut. 
we met the, the warden of the park and we went to his office. Uh, here's a man who's you know over six foot, dressed in fatigues. He's one of those men's men who eats men for breakfast and very stern and serious. And when Travis told him the story of our commercial, all of a sudden he slapped a hand on the table. He says, this is great. Who came up with this idea? And he became a fan. We met with Jeremiah at 7.30. So we followed him into the park and, and waited as he stopped and looked at a herd along the way. And it was a herd of big males, um, which was very exciting to see. And apparently one of them had an injury and it meant that he could actually you know, dart it and treat it. When Dr. Jeremiah decided to dart his gun, he took the medicine on the opposite side of the car. The medicine is extremely dangerous. If you prick your finger and touch the medicine, you will basically die very quickly. One of the rangers came up to us and was laughing and saying, ah, oh, you know, there's just, there's, uh, there's just two lions over there under that tree. <laughs> Travis had said, there's lions? Are, are they going to bother us? And Vladimir said, are they going to bother us? And I said, well, they're the least of our trouble today. <laughs> we stayed in our car while they were loading the dart, and they signaled us to follow them. And they started off, and they just took off the, the road and went into the bush and, and started uh, tracking the elephants, and we were right behind them. And we were just zigzagging in and out of bushes and in and out of trees and trying to keep a, a you know, line of sight with the elephant they wanted to dart. I had this stab of live fear that, look at the size of this beast. How can we possibly control what's about to happen? And um, so they got very close to the group and pushed them and they started running and they, they isolated the big male and, and pushed, pulled him away from the group. They, they pulled up alongside him. It happened very, very quickly. And uh, Jeremiah just leaned over the roof hatch and pointed his gun and pulled, and the dart went out and hit the elephant perfectly in his rear end. So after they darted the big male, he took off in a run, and the other three followed him. And it can take a minute for an elephant to drop, but it can also be five minutes. And these elephants were, were moving so fast, we, we lost sight of them, and we had to stop and the rangers were ahead of us looking for them through the bushes and we could see them gesticulating, pointing, then starting off again with their car and we were following again. Then we started to make ground on them and the big elephant still hadn't gone down. And it's been past five minutes and suddenly we noticed there were no longer four of them, there was three. And you could see this great brown pile on the ground. All right, <laughs> he's down. The rangers actually had their vehicle and they were chasing two of them away and Kira took our vehicle and chased the the other big one away. And so here we were, you know, traveled thousands of miles, drove for hours, remote area, we found the elephant. And we have 20 minutes to do this, we have one take to do this. Um, I even got to uh, wash the elephant's tusks to make them look better and I was given help by that with all the rangers. And meanwhile, they were dousing the elephant with, uh, with water to keep him, um, to keep him cool, uh, while um, Dr. Jeremiah dressed the wound, which was septic. Undoing the shirts that they are, they're gonna to wear to move the tusks and to shoot the elephant with the AK-47 to resuscitate him. Did you actually get the arrow itself? Did you find it or had it fallen out? Yeah, the arrow was uh, luckily had fallen out and uh, the wound is uh, in the process of healing. But with the intervention, we expected the wound within one or two weeks to be fully healed. Tell us a little bit about this bull. How old is he? The bull is quite big. This bull is uh, quite big. You can see the task is quite heavy. And uh, I'm expecting uh, to be not less than 40 years old. And um, finally we were ready. We, we got the tusks, our tusks carried over in place where they should have been, um, and we were ready to have the elephant be allowed to stand up again. Dr. Jeremiah told us that it's extremely dangerous. When the elephant wakes up, they're disoriented and angry, and many times they charge whoever is standing in front of them. And last year, a doctor was killed by an elephant who got up quickly. So for the last shot of the sequence, we were told we have to be inside our vehicles. Travis was at the wheel, ready to bolt out of there. He was given another dart to wake him up, 
he couldn't quite believe it. You know, one minute he's feeling perfectly fine, the next minute he's waking up and doesn't really understand why he was, you know, asleep. But he was very sweet, and he, when he stood up, he looked straight at us and kind of stood there with his head swaying back and forth, and his trunk was very busy on the ground, sniffing around, trying to figure out where he was and where are his friends and which way he should go. And he took his time, and he followed his trunk, and slowly off he went. He just kind of In the out. direction that his friends had taken. When I'm in the presence of elephants, I sense this majestic, deliberate vigilance. If we could bring some of that deliberate vigilance to our attitude about this problem, I think we could make great strides forward. Poaching in East Africa, has it hasn't been this critically um, serious to the species since the 1970s. And they're saying now that there are dozens of animals being killed weekly. Elephants face many challenges today between climate change, habitat loss, and competition for resources with people, that if the ivory slaughter continues unchecked and unabated, elephants may well not survive into the next generation. I would hate to see this world without elephants. I want my kids to be able to grow up and see them, and I want my grandchildren to also be able to see them. And what's happening today is as devastating as what happened to the American bison over 100 years ago. But the difference is, is that we can actually do something to stop it. Do we know the impact that our film will have? Of course not, you know, but if we can curb the human thirst for ivory, if one person can change their mind, and if it means one more elephant saved, then, then it was all worth it. The whole adventure came down to actually standing next to the elephant as he was darted and putting my hands on his flank feeling my feet in the African dirt and his breathing moving my body back and forth. And I felt the conduit between the elephant and me and the ground the same way I hope this film makes a conduit between the different cultures and what it is that we want to have happen.